All right, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and flip to Romans with me. Uh, we're going to take kind of a broad overview of Romans in just a couple of minutes. So we're going to look at the, entire, uh, the entirety of the letter, and we're going to do that in just a, a few short minutes. Now, I realize we could spend weeks or months going through every word of this book, and in fact, Jason did that not that long ago in the Wednesday night class. Um, but what we're going to look at tonight is, is the theme of Romans. Romans is a book about conflict. Uh, the Jewish and Gentile Christians in Rome were struggling to keep their church together, and Paul's primary purpose in this letter is to get them to accept one another. So if you look in chapters 14 and 15 specifically, you see Paul getting to the business of what needs to be done. Um, in his, in his, his style, as we've looked at before, he doesn't start that way, though. Uh, he looks at a lot of other things before getting to the conflict at hand. Um, I think that's really important. He begins Romans in the first three chapters. Uh, by discussing the fact that all men are sinners who struggle to live right. Um, and this is a principle everybody has to acknowledge if inter internal problems are to be resolved. He then spends a great deal of time focusing on the fact that the gospel is the answer to man's sin problem, which again is something everybody in the church would have agreed with. So if you just look at, at the structure of Romans, you might be inclined to think there's a lot of wandering around in those first few chapters, and I don't believe that's accurate. I think Paul knows exactly what he's doing. I don't think this is an author who's just in need of a point, so he's saying a bunch of stuff. I think his point is to take the same strategy in Romans that he takes in other, uh, in other parts of the gospel, which is to say that um, I appreciate you, because if you look in chapter 1, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of appreciations. There's a lot of positivity. And then as the book progresses, it changes to getting into the business of what it is that he wants to do. And a big theme of this is resolving conflict within the church. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of passages from Romans. One passage will be in chapter 1, and then we're going to skip to chapter 14. Uh, I'm going to start in chapter 1, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of His Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. So he starts in a way that we talked about in the very first week and in the second week where he's telling people what they mean to him. Now, if you look in verse 14, the tone really changes. So the beginning of chapter 14, excuse me, chapter 14, Romans chapter 14, verse 1, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. That's an important theme for what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, chapter 14, verse 13, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Again, direct messages. Verse 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. I am going to read that verse again. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Now, why is that the last verse I read? Because we tonight are discussing your conflict. We are discussing how conflict exists in your marriage, and we are going to talk about what we can do to try and move beyond the conflict that you've experienced in the past. I want to start by making sure you understand something. A healthy marriage is not conflict-free. It's inevitable. Conflict is going to happen. In fact, most research indicates that in terms of emotional availability, about 9% of the time, both spouses in the relationship are emotionally available. I'm going to say that again. 9% of the time, both spouses are emotionally available at the same time. Okay, that leaves like 91% of your life for there to be some conflict, right? Everybody has conflict and they experience, in different, experience that conflict in different ways. Uh, a healthy marriage isn't devoid of conflict. Uh, it's respectful and it attacks problems and not people. And that's going to be the theme of what we're looking at tonight. I want to start, though, by attacking a few myths of marital conflict. Now, some of you in this room, you may see some stuff on this list that applies to you. Uh, that is okay. If you want to elbow your spouse, that's fine, uh, but don't make a big show about it. So, so here are some myths of marital conflict. Myth number one, we just talked about this, that some couples don't have it. The more conflict that exists in your relationship, the more likely you are to think that other couples are just conflict-free and they all have it better than me. Okay, that's a myth. Conflict exists in every couple. If you tell me we don't ever fight about anything, okay, the definition of fight may have something to do with that sentence. You see what I mean? Conflict exists in every relationship no matter what. Uh, next myth we're going to talk about. Healthy marriages solve all of their problems. If you have been battling with an issue that you've been struggling with and you argue about it like once every four or five weeks, and that's been going on for like 20 years, that's okay. 
That's actually really normal. Uh, in fact, research indicates that nearly 70% of the issues that exist in a marriage never get solved. Sounds weird, right? It's kind of depressing. It's not. It should be encouraging because that thing that you've been banging your head against for the last two decades, everybody else does too. So that's good. Uh, couples can live with unresolvable conflicts about perpetual issues in their relationship as long as those issues are not deal breakers. Okay, so if we're talking about a faith base, that may be something that can't be, that can't be uh, uh, an issue that you live with. Um, if you're talking about uh, goals for your children, that may not be something that, that you can just kind of sit in conflict with. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day stuff, a lot of those things never get fixed. It's not the presence of conflict that stresses the relationship. It's the manner in which people respond. All right, number three, that's when the truth comes out. That's one of my favorite sentences to deal with in marriage counseling sessions, because here's what I get. We were yelling, and we were angry, and then he said this thing, and it was awful and mean, and he said it when he was mad, so that's how I know he meant it. The reality is we tend to think that the worst things that we hear from our spouse in those moments of anger, that's the truth, when the simple fact of the matter is it's not. By and large, what comes out of our mouth when we're angry is not the unfiltered truth as the other person perceives it. It's whatever will hurt the most. We just throw the biggest rock. Does that make sense? I say that not to say you're off the hook for everything you ever say in, in a moment of anger. Do not interpret it that way. But if you've been struggling with something that your husband said to you in a moment of anger, something your wife said to you in a moment of anger, and it's come up repeatedly over the last few years, um, it, it's possible. I don't know what it was, so I'm not going to put my reputation behind this statement, but I am going to say it's possible that uh, that was not truth. It's possible that that was just the most hurtful thing they could say in that moment. Now, we want to talk about avoiding that, but I want to give you some, some clarity there. Uh, point number four, another myth is that you need to keep fighting even if it takes all night. Uh, wow. Um, sometimes, I believe there, in Ephesians 4, Paul talks about not letting the sun set on our anger. And I realize that that has been interpreted at times as not going to bed angry. I believe that's a problem with the way we interpret that scripture. Uh, so I talked, to, I talked to James Hawk about that scripture, and I mentioned this during the chapel class because I wanted some clarity from somebody who was much more of an authority in that area than myself. And his interpretation is one that I've really clung to because it made a lot of sense to me, and it was about as concise as it could be. Uh, he read it to me, and he said, I believe it says not to prolong reconciliation. Don't delay reconciliation. And so I asked point blank, I said, so do you interpret that as don't go to bed angry? And he said, no, I, delay, I, I, I view it as uh, don't delay reconciliation. And I say that because I think we've kind of gotten a misperception of what that says. And so we have this idea not to go to bed angry. Sometimes going to bed angry is exactly what you need to do. And we're going to talk about that here in just a few minutes. Number five, and this one's kind of scary. If the volume goes up, it's a major problem. Um, I'm going to guess that, that you're going to expect me to talk about not yelling. And I am going to talk about not yelling. Again, this is not about green lighting all of your terrible decisions. Uh, but yelling is not in and of itself a horrible thing. Some of us, notice what I just said. Some of us, us, are not you, us, are very passionate people. And when we get worked up, sometimes there's therapy in us raising our voice. It's not the yelling that's the problem. It's what you're yelling that's the problem and what you're yelling at that's the problem. So if the words that come out of your mouth in the midst of that volume going up are, are, are directed at your spouse in a, in a negative way, that's a problem. And if it's something that is a problem uh, in front of your kids, that is another issue. So volume going up is definitely not something that's good, but I don't want you to feel like it means your marriage is broken. Uh, and then point number six, walking out on an argument is always bad. That is yet another myth that we are going to explore tonight. Sometimes the best thing you can do is take a deep breath and very calmly and rationally exit the conversation with the intent of going back to it. All right, I want to say something. Uh, the, the conversation tonight is going to be personal. We're going to talk about conflict animals. It's going to be very personal. Uh, when we talk about your uh, fighting style and we talk about the way you engage negatively with your spouse, we have a tendency to take this conversation really personally. Um, I, I want you to know something. If you feel convicted of anything tonight, uh, just explore why you may feel convicted of it and try your best not to take it personally. Uh, we're talking about some broad concepts tonight. So let's talk about conflict animals. Um, here's, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you four animals. Okay, now this is not an activity, this is I'm going to give you an explanation, then we do the activity. So you need to see the explanation first. Uh, we'll go to the activity in a few minutes. Let's talk about conflict animals. I'm going to give you four. These are four different conflict styles. You will probably see yourself somewhere in these four animals. So here's what I would like for you to do. As we're talking, I want you to think about two questions. Which one do you connect with, 
And then which one do you connect your spouse with? I then want you to fight the urge to turn and stare at them and poke at them and say, are you listening to that? Um, Because at the end, I want you to have a moment where you express to each other how you perceive this activity, but I don't want you to give them the answer yet. Because how you perceive your partner is going to be really important. Whether you agree is important. So think about it, but don't share your answers yet. All right, I I also want to say this. Uh, We are talking about conflict styles. I'm going to compare you to four different animals. I am only comparing you to your conflict style. That is it. That is the limit. It is the way you engage in conflict. And with that in mind, let's talk about the angry dog approach. There's the angry dog. This is the first conflict style. The angry dog does what you see in this picture. When conflict presents itself, the dog attacks it. And it goes for the jugular a lot of the time, but it's defensive and it's angry and it wants to attack problems. It wants to be sure that it's super proactive. It gets on top of the conversation and it doesn't let things slide very easily. Now, if your thought is, well, okay, that kind of describes me, but I'm not some big vicious dog. Fine, you be the fight chihuahua. (laughs) So you are gonna be the conflict chihuahua. Now, I'm gonna take you through all four of these animals. I'm gonna give you advantages to your fighting style disadvantages to your fighting style, and then a little bit of advice if this is you. So let's start with the advantages. There are advantages to being the conflict chihuahua. Number one, you address issues. You're proactive, so stuff doesn't tend to linger. Uh, it, can be, it can be good because you can get done with issues. There are things that need to be addressed. You are willing to address them, and I appreciate that about you. It's also really, I want this chihuahua on my team. That's a good thing. If this is your fight style, that's, that's not a bad thing. I don't want you to feel like I'm demonizing your behavior. I just want you to be in touch with your behavior. So the advantages are it's good to have this person on your side. They attack things. They're not passive aggressive. Now, the disadvantages. At times, you may say some things you regret. Uh, you can dominate the argument. So you and your spouse can be in the midst of an argument, and you can find yourself talking way more than the spouse because you really want to make sure you win that argument and that your points are made. So you have a tendency to dominate the argument. And because of that, there are times in your marriage where you can struggle to actually empathize with what your partner is experiencing because you have one goal. This chihuahua does not want to empathize. This chihuahua wants to win. This chihuahua wants to attack and grab onto whatever it is and shake it until it's dead. That's what they want to do. And as a, as, a, as a spouse, there are times where we don't stop and really think about our partner's point of view because we are in fight chihuahua mode. Now, if you are the conflict chihuahua, here's my advice to you tonight. Number one, listen to understand before you engage. So actually listen, and I can give you a little heads up on how you do that. You can actually say before saying anything else, if you are the fight chihuahua, here's a phrase for you. What I'm hearing you say is... And then you say what you're hearing and then enter into the conversation. And the reason for that is because, number one, you are confirming with your spouse that you're listening to what they're saying. Number two, you give them a chance to clarify anything you may have missed. All right, uh, I get, I know, number two, I get, there's like three out of five weeks I've said something about tone. Uh, If you're a a fight chihuahua, uh, you you might want to watch that bark because it can get really uh, problematic. Uh, Next, I want you to focus on the problem and not the person, and then I want you to take breaks if necessary. You're going to see that phrase, take breaks if necessary, a number of times. I'm going to get more specific about that later. All right, so that is my fight chihuahua. By the way, um, at the end of this, once we've done all four of these, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you advice for handling a spouse that is this particular fight animal. So if you are married to a conflict chihuahua, stay tuned. The jackrabbit. If you are a jackrabbit, here's how you handle conflict. When conflict happens, it can startle you, and you want it to end as quickly as possible. A jackrabbit tends to run from conflict. Now, we have in our minds a picture of this. So we want to picture a rabbit actually fleeing physically away from conflict. And it can look like that. But oftentimes, instead of actually physically fleeing, what it looks like is you, as as the person in the conflict, you just want that conflict to end as quickly as possible. So you'll you'll sometimes say things and agree to things that you probably shouldn't have, but you just wanted that conflict to end. Okay? Now, if I just said something that that stuck with you, then then stay tuned because we're about to get into some stuff. Here are the advantages of being the jackrabbit. Uh, There is a low risk of you engaging in explosive arguments. If your first instinct is to flee, to end the conflict as quickly as possible, odds are you're not going to find yourself in deep, angry arguments. Uh, You want to resolve conflict quickly. That's awesome. I really respect that about this particular fight style. That's great. And you tend to go with the flow, which is also a very good thing. The disadvantage, though, is that you often feel like your voice isn't heard. Now, here's the catch to that. 
you feel like your voice isn't heard, not because your partner's not listening to your voice, but because you didn't really express it. Because you just kind of agreed to whatever needed to be agreed to, and you were, you were kind of agreeable in moments where maybe you shouldn't have been because you wanted that conversation to end. Uh, you can also agree to things you later regret, and that creates resentment. So if you feel like, well, he gets everything he wants in arguments, or she gets everything she wants in arguments, it's possible they're not accepting your influence, is what we talked about last week. But it's also possible that your conflict style is not such that your partner really uh, uh, has much of a say other than to get what they want, because you're not offering your own opinion. All right, last point. If you are the jackrabbit, here's my advice to you. Number one, take your time. Express your needs. Be sure to express your needs. Also, readdress the issue if necessary. If your conflict style is what I just described, let me encourage you to do something. When the conversation is over, come back to it like an hour or two later. And for your spouse, it's going to drive them nuts. We're going to talk about that. Come back to it an hour or two later. If something else pops up, and spouse, you need to be sure that that's a safe thing for them to do. Last thing, and I put this on here uh, because it's important. If this is your fight style, um, it, it may be worth your time to consider doing some self-confidence and anxiety work on your own. Because oftentimes, this fight style is correlated to people who are struggling in those areas. All right, let's talk about the next fight animal. We have the fight turtle. The advantage is, well, the, the fight turtle is exactly what you would expect. The fight turtle kind of collapses in on himself when the fight takes place. Uh, the jackrabbit tends to flee. The turtle just kind of disappears. Um, they don't really engage. They shut down in conflict. And here is the advantage of that. Again, low risk of explosive arguments. This person can be a really good listener, and they process internally, which by nature kind of makes them more introspective. So if you are a conflict turtle, that's okay. There are some really, really good advantages to that. There are also some disadvantages. One, sometimes people don't know you're upset. I don't know if you can relate to that, but sometimes you can be upset for an extended period of time. People don't realize it because you kind of disappear inside yourself and you just kind of look like you always look so nobody realizes you're upset. Uh, your disengagement can also be perceived as agreement. So you kind of disengage and people can perceive that as you agreeing. Uh, finally, you can carry resentment because, well, they don't care about my needs when, again, the reality is you've kind of disappeared in yourself. Uh, my advice to you is this. Find another outlet. Um, what I'm going to say is going to sound really bizarre, and especially if you didn't, um, if you didn't grow up with technology, uh, there are times when a fight can be resolved via text message. And I realize that that sounds crazy, and I realize that for some of you, I, that, that may be a line for you. For a fight turtle, that can be a savior. For a fight turtle, to go to a room and write things down and come back and share those thoughts can be really therapeutic and can be really productive. Now, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. I'm just giving you a heads up. Last one. Man, I'm going to tread lightly. Fight hippo. This one's my favorite. I'm going to give you a fun fact about the hippo. Um, the hippopotamus accounts for more deaths in Africa every year than any other animal. You may not have known that. Uh, I, I, I love that stat for some reason. I don't know why. Here's, here's the thing with the hippo. The hippo is very calm and very collected, and very together, and just kind of hanging out in the water. Do you know why they account for more deaths every year in Africa than any other animal? Because they look docile, you don't really even notice them. And then you do something that offends them, and they turn around with those big jaws, and they clamp down in one shot, and the whole thing's over. Can you relate to that? So as a, as a spouse, you're kind of quiet, you're kind of taking it, you're kind of whatever, you're kind of what, and you don't really say anything, but the 10 words you offer are horrifying. And they're major, and they're big, and they're colossal. That's a fight hippopotamus, right? Here are the advantages of being a fight hippo. If you can prevent that big bite, they actually handle things really well. They're really good at dealing with stuff if you can prevent that big bite. They also tend to be good listeners, and they're patient to a point. The disadvantages of the fight hippo, uh, they can say really, really hurtful things. Uh, those bites, when they have those moments where they finally had enough and they turn around and they snap, those bites tend to be so severe that they can leave lasting scars on relationships. Um, the things that you remember, the worst moments in your marriage that you remember between the two of you were probably fight hippo moments. Were probably moments where somebody said something that was big, that was colossal, and that, and that uh, left a permanent mark. Um, and they, they react when they're threatened. So when they feel personally attacked, that's when the hippo is going to turn and do its thing. If you are a fight hippo, number one, I want to encourage you to talk. It is really important that you talk. Actually be involved in the discussion. Uh, take a break when you need to, like we are with the other ones, and be clear about how you're feeling right then. When you feel frustrated, make sure somebody knows you feel frustrated. That can help take the air out of the balloon. All right, so here's your job. Which one are you? Now, you'll notice I used an example here that was not on there. You can be a hybrid. 
This is a dog turtle. Elements of a dog, elements of a turtle. I don't recommend Google searching those things because you get some weird stuff. Uh, if you look at, at your, your, uh, your handout tonight, here's what I want you to look at. I want you to ask uh, one question. First, which one do you connect with? Which of those animals do you connect with most? Second question, which one do you connect your spouse with? Now, if you feel like, I don't really connect with any of those, but here's one that I do connect with, and you're going to go upper level on me, okay, you've got the freedom and flexibility to do that, but I do want you to be able to explain it to me when we're done. I'm going to give you just a few minutes. You do not need to write an extended answer for this. What I want you to do is I want you to talk to each other. So let's do this first. Let's start with the husbands. Here's how we're going to do this. Husband, I want you to tell your wife what animal you believe yourself to be, and then your wife can tell you what animal she believed you to be. When you've done that conversation, then reverse wife, you talk to the husband. I'll give you two or three minutes. Go ahead. All right. Come on back. Quick question before we finish up this last section. Anybody come up with something that wasn't on the list? Did anybody get creative and come up with their own animal? What'd you come up with? Anybody want to tell me? I'm, I'm, hang on, say it again. A what did? A rat dog? Rat dog, yes, sorry, got it. Yes, okay, so a combination of a rabbit and a dog. All right, good. Anything that wasn't on the list at all? Anybody get like really creative? Okay, good. All right, so here's the deal. We're going to talk. If you, if you picked up a little bit of, of you in one and a little bit of you in another, that's fantastic. But here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about if you're married to these animals, what do you need to be thinking about? Okay? I, I promise you this is the most important part of what we're going to do. If you are married to a fight chihuahua, here's your, here's your lifeline. You ready? If you're married to a fight chihuahua, number one, I want you to be really intentional in starting your conversations in a non-aggressive way. We're going to talk in a minute about the beginning of a conversation being the most important. Be intentional about starting in a non-aggressive way. Number two, take breaks. If you are working, if you are working with a fight chihuahua, take breaks, man. Uh, when things get really heated, you've got to be willing to step out. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, use the timer we're going to talk about in a minute, which I know sounds weird, but you got to stay with me. Stick to I statements as much as possible. If you're, if you're engaged in conflict with a fight chihuahua, make it about yourself as often as you can. Say things like, I feel, it is my opinion, I believe. Those are things that are harder to argue with. They're not impossible, but they're harder to argue with. Uh, so you want to be using those I statements as often as possible. Uh, the last thing, you need to redirect that tone. Ooh, I'm going to get you hit. All right, so here's how this works. Here's how, when, when you're engaged in conflict with a fight chihuahua and that tone has gotten really bad, can I give you, can I give you my bailout phrase that's impossible to argue with? They're still going to get mad, but they're already mad. Uh, my, my phrase for that is, I really want to have this conversation, but I'm having a really hard time focusing on anything other than the way you're talking to me. Yeah. Can't argue with me now. I want to debate with you. I want to discuss with you, but I can't focus on anything other than the way you're presenting this information. That is a really safe way to express to your partner that I can't handle the tone that you're bringing at me right now. Uh, all right, if you are married to a rabbit, stay calm. You don't want to scare the rabbit away. <laughs> so you need to go in really calm. It's a problem we're going to solve, but everything's fine. We're rocking on. Everything's great. So you want to stay calm. I want you to remember something if you are married to a rabbit. You're angry because of a circumstance or a situation. You are not angry because your spouse is a terrible human being. You need to take that approach as you walk in. You're not upset that your spouse is awful or your spouse is whatever. Uh, you are angry because there is a circumstance that you need to address. So keep that in mind. Um, ask for agreement confirmation. So as you're talking through resolution with, with your rabbit partner, uh, ask for agreement confirmation. Do you agree with this? Do you agree with that? Uh, open doors to allow your partner to express their feelings and don't be upset if you are married to a rabbit or a turtle. Don't be upset if they take me up on this. If after the conversation's over and you feel like that conversation has been resolved, you've got to open the door to let them come back to the conversation when they've had a chance to process it without you around. That's not a bad thing. What we tend to happen though, what we tend to have happen though is in those moments, they come back to re-engage with us and what do we do? We already did this. We already talked about this. We get so frustrated because they're going back to it. That's good. They've had a chance to process. Now, get to a better place of resolution by engaging in the conversation. 
All right, if your partner is a turtle, uh, allow for different types of communication. I know that when I just said that it's okay sometimes to resolve a fight via text message, I had some people who bristled internally, or maybe externally. I get that that sounds weird, but for someone who processes internally, it is valuable for them to get out of your presence to be able to process in a calm environment and then to deliver back to you whatever comes out. And sometimes doing that in, a, uh, in the form of a digital communication is perfectly fine. Uh, I want to say something else about turtles. They process internally. You call that slower. You'll say like, well, I just process faster. No, you don't. You process differently. So I say that because it's not slower, it's internal. You can't see the process so it looks slower. And when they're done, they have to go back to the beginning and explain it to you. That's why it looks slower, but it's not slower, it's internal. I say that because oftentimes those people who are fight turtles can take that really personally. They feel attacked because they process differently. And because internally feels like slower, they take that as a shot. If your partner is a fight hippo, don't dominate the conversation. I cannot stress that enough. If your partner is prone to some hippo-like tendencies, uh, I want to be sure that you understand what I mean. Don't dominate the conversation. Give your partner a lot of opportunity to talk. Uh, they don't show the full extent of it, but they're really annoyed after about the first three minutes. That's part of the deal, and that's okay if you know it. So take a break if you see them getting upset. Here's what I want you to think about. This is the goal for fight animals. I want you to work together as a pack of wolves who's targeting a problem, not another wolf. Okay? You are a team, and I want you to begin the process tonight of acting like it. So in these last 15 minutes, let's talk about some tools for every animal that will help make you better at this process. Uh, first of all, you can do all the things that we've done so far. Everything that we've done so far has been about preventing these moments. It's been about uh, preventing the, the conflict from taking place. But what did I say in the very beginning? I said that conflict is going to happen no matter what. So let's talk about some things that you need to be thinking about as this conflict engages. I'm going to give you some stuff that you may struggle with. Before you say a word in a moment of conflict, here are the things I want you to think about. Number one, the word normal is very, very relative. Next week is, I told you last week was probably my favorite night. Next week is probably the most important. Here's what we're going to do next week. Next week, we're going to talk about the family you came from. And we're going to talk about what that looks like. And we're going to talk about how your interpretations of husbands and wives are different than your spouses. And we're going to talk about how that has impacted your marriage from the very beginning. Okay, now I say that because normal is very relative. What may be normal and a normal way to fight for you may not be normal for your spouse. You may have grown up in a home with yelling and screaming. That may scare your partner to death. Okay, so we need to understand that normal is very relative. So before you've said a word, understand that it's very relative. Number two, don't argue about whether you should feel whatever you are and vice versa. The vast majority of your argument is spent deciding whether or not you're allowed to be upset. Uh, and I know you can relate to that because we've all done it. I'm frustrated that blah, well, why are you frustrated? You shouldn't be frustrated. Well, what about this? And now we're arguing about whether or not the person has a right to be frustrated. Don't waste time arguing about whether or not they should be frustrated, because here's a hint. They already are frustrated. So it's on the table. Let's get past it. Okay, so focus on the problem. Uh, finally, don't fight about the fight. After like three or four minutes, we start doing this. Well, no, no, three minutes ago, do you remember what you said? You said that I, you're laughing because you do it all the time. Uh, we, we, we have a tendency to go back to the beginning of the fight. No, 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 you interrupted me a minute ago. That's why I'm interrupting you now. And so we fight about the fight. I'm going to ask a quick question. 30 seconds, ready? For 30 seconds, I want you to look at this list. One, two, three. Look at your spouse. Do you struggle with one of these? Talk about which one it is for 30 seconds. Go. All right. If you are being completely honest, I'm going to guess most of you could have said all three of these at some point. Um, my job, my entire professional career is about studying marriages and working with individuals to be happier and to be more calm and be more in control. Uh, we struggle, April and I struggle with all three of these at various times. Okay, this is not something you're ever going to master. Remember what I said at the beginning? 70% of the problems that are in a marriage are kind of perpetual and they continue over and over. Conflict exists. Doesn't matter how, how, how uh, educated you may be in this, in this area, doesn't matter how much you practice these things, you're still going to be prone to having these moments creep in. Now, once you've had this moment where you've thought about these things, you want to start things off the right way. I'm going to give you some things that may be surprising. First of all, uh, there is a, a lot of research in this field, but I would point you specifically to John Gottman's research that talks about the idea that in the first three minutes of any conversation, you can, you can identify how the conversation will end and what the tone of the conversation is going to be. So basically, here's what that means. Just about everything important happens in the first three minutes. So if you've been arguing for more than five, six, seven, ten minutes, you're probably not doing anything super productive. 
Okay, now, it's pretty easy to guess. Okay, well, in the first three minutes, you're going to give a lot of information, and the tone's going to be there. But there's another thing about this that you may be surprised to hear. Uh, the first three minutes of conflict can also predict, predict with incredible accuracy whether a marriage is going to end in divorce. And here's what I mean. Couples who struggle in the first three minutes over the longitudinal period of time, so over the course of a year, over the course of 18 months, are shockingly likely to end in divorce because their conflict looks so bad and it feels so draining at the end of it. Uh, marriages that enter into conflict with contempt, with name-calling, if that happens in the first three minutes, you can predict with a pretty high degree of certainty that that marriage is not going to last. So the three characteristics of conflict masters, which is kind of a phrase, actually. Three, uh, the first three or three characteristics of people who are really good at conflict. Number one, they start with a personal feeling. They do that using an I statement. I feel this way. Uh, they express what the problem is rather than who. I feel this way when this thing happens. And then finally, they express a need for the future. So if you are looking for the right approach, and you've got an outline for this on the last page, uh, we're going to talk through some of it here in just a minute. Uh, you start with an I statement. Now, you'll notice any complaint I have with my wife, any complaint you have with your husband, I would encourage you to start with I feel. Those first two words are really important. Now, I get that it, it feels very therapisty to say that. Uh, I talk about your feelings. But in this particular moment, what you're going to do is prevent your partner from becoming defensive quickly. Uh, most of the time when we approach uh, our spouses, we put them in a defensive posture and then we blame them for being defensive. I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Here's the problem we're going to work through. The dishes are in the sink even though he said he'd do them. That never happens to anybody, so it's hypothetical. Here's the bad startup. Why don't you ever just do the dishes? You always do this and I always end up doing them myself. I have a lot of problems with that sentence. Number one, the first part of the sentence. It's just kind of an accusatory, put you back on your heels. It's defensive time. Because what you just did is you just told him to come up with an excuse. That's what that first sentence is. That first sentence, and by the way, your kids do the same thing. When, you're, when you start in these conversations with, why didn't you blah, 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 the answer, you, what you just told them was come up with something quick, come up with something quick, because there might be an answer to that question that might get them out of trouble. All right, that's a different conversation. Uh, you always do this, and I always end up doing it myself. Can you do me a favor, if you, if you do nothing else tonight, can you promise me that you'll drop the word always from your vocabulary with your spouse? The idea that you always do this and I always do that, that is incredibly detrimental. Let me tell you why. As soon as you say always, you know what you just did? Now you're assaulting their character. Now you're telling them that they are a bad spouse because they always do this thing. So you're putting them in a defensive posture. So drop the word always. Focus on what's happening right now. Now here's the good startup. It stresses me out when the sink is full of dishes. Because that's, by the way, that's why you're upset. If it didn't bother you, you wouldn't be bringing it up. It stresses me out that the, uh, the sink is full of dishes. Can you take care of that for me so I can have that stress off my plate? I made that all about me, but you notice something else I did in this sentence. I actually did ask. I didn't say, like, can we hypothetically come up with a way to solve the dish problem? Now, there's room for that, and we're going to do that in just a second. But what I did was, we both know that I asked you to do the dishes, and you didn't do the dishes. So I'm going to ask you again. Can you do the dishes? But I'm going to do it in this way. Now, is your partner going to be upset by this? Yeah, probably. But the reality is, the way they've heard it is, you have a concern, you have asked them to address that concern, and you need some help with it. Now, um, for ongoing problems, so things that happen over time that you want to solve, same type of thing. Don't attack, your uh, uh, don't attack your spouse, attack the problem. You're a team, approach it like one. I'm going to give you an example of that. I feel stressed when the sink is full of dishes, and that stress seems to happen a lot. Can you help me figure out a way to get that done on a more routine basis? Okay, remember, the problem, if the dishes are in the sink all the time, your dishwashing system is problematic. Okay, now maybe the problem is you've entrusted your spouse who has no interest in the dishes. Well, if that's the case, rather than berating them about their lack of interest in the dishes, you have a dish problem. Help me solve this dish problem. And if the, end of the, uh, the, the, the solution to the dish problem is, okay, I'm going to do them, but you need to chill out on how often I do them. There's room for that now with this conversation. You see what I mean? All right, I just hit a nerve with somebody because she started laughing. All right, so here's the summary. What I feel, what causes me to feel this way, and the specific request, or can you help me solve this? Now, I want to take a look at something. I, I'm, I only have time to give you one quick idea. Look at number three. I'm sorry, page three. Page three is your roadmap for getting into this dialogue. Ready? You decide what the issue is that you need to address, and then you go through steps two, three, and four to figure, out, um, to figure out how to create that I statement at the end. 
Point number five, name the one thing, or name at least one thing you agree on in this conversation. You know what the thing I would agree on in the dish conversation is? Neither one of us likes that you nag me all the time about the dishes. We both agree on that. You don't like constantly having to tell me about the dishes, and I don't like constantly having to hear about the dishes. So we agree on that, which means we need to solve our dish problem. Um, number seven is, what's the right way to open this discussion? Now, number six is kind of fun. What's the wrong way to open this discussion? Yeah, have fun with that. That's a field day. Uh, number seven, what's the right way to open this discussion? Now, in the sake of time, or for the sake of time, we only have about five minutes left. And I've got a few more things that we need to cover, so I'm going to skip the, the issue, the, the interactive part of this. Here's what I want to do. Take that with you, and when we're done tonight, your homework tonight is one issue. Pick one issue. Find a way to approach the conversation with your spouse in a way that is non-threatening. With that in mind, let's talk about just a couple more things we're going to do quickly. The last suggestion I have for you is this. I want, to, I want you to learn to yield to your partner. Um, yielding in a conversation means this. It means everybody gets a chance to talk and everybody gets a chance to give an opinion. It means that, uh, that failing to yield, so failing to yield to another car means you're going to crash because you're both trying to go at the same time. Yielding doesn't mean concession. It means allowing your partner to have an influence and you having an influence. Going back to what we talked about last week. I, I can't say this uh, strongly enough. Nobody can lose all the time. It's, we're just not designed that way. Uh, I used to work um, my job in Mesquite. I, I was a family therapist for the district, and I worked with kids, the elementary kids who went to behavior school or went to alternative school. So I dealt with the parents of kids who pulled dry erase boards off of walls and kids who broke things and kids who attacked other kids. Um, you know what I noticed? You want, to, uh, you, want to, you want to get a dry erase board taken off a wall, take a kid's options away, and don't let them win anything. You make sure that they, they get constantly berated with their behavior and they never feel like they have any power. That's when crazy stuff happens. And those of you who are teachers can probably relate to what I'm talking about. You take somebody's power away and that's when you get the crazy version. Now, how do we yield without coming off like a, uh, uh, like a jerk to our spouse? One, we recognize the good points as much as the ones you disagree with. When you're in an argument with your spouse, can you find something that you can agree on, something that you can connect with? Focus on those good moments. Two, find a part of the request that you can fulfill. I find that to be very valuable. And when possible, and I can't stress this enough, if your partner feels more passionately about an area that is, that is negotiable, let them have one from time to time. This is not done in the spirit of, oh, I'm just going to pat her on the head and let her have this one. I mean literally, really and truly, respect your partner enough to let them feel empowered in the relationship. Let them win from time to time. Now, what if you're here anyway? What if we've done all these things and you still find yourself in a situation where you are yelling and screaming? Uh, I'm going to give you some very practical tools. Number one, take a break. And here's what that looks like. I need to collect myself. We can continue this conversation in a little bit. If you can learn how to say that sentence well, then you remove yourself from the conversation. Calmly walk away. Do not slam doors. Do not yell and scream. Do not do the high school thing where you peel out in the driveway and then peel out in the truck on the way out. You only do that when she, she leaves you at senior prom. Okay? You're not at prom anymore, so when you leave the house, do it calmly. Uh, I feel a little better now. Can we continue? Once you've had a break, this is the most important part. If you're going to walk away from a conflict with your spouse, the, the most important part of that is ensuring to your spouse that you come back to that conflict. Do not leave your spouse hanging with a conflict that hasn't been resolved. Come back, and I would encourage you to make it no more than, to me, about a half hour is good. If you're going to take a break for longer than that, uh, you need to be sure your spouse agrees to that, and your spouse agrees that that's okay. Otherwise, you need to keep talking. Um, I got a quick question for you. Why do we yell at each other? Domination. Domination that's a great word. What else? She's in the other room. She's in the other room. <laughs> that's a good point. I don't want to get up. All right, so here's why we yell at each other. We yell at each other because we're, it's conversational pacing. Okay? We yell at each other because there's been an escalation, usually. We're trying to get on top of the conversation. Our partner's talking over us, and then we start to talk back, and it gets up, and it gets up, and it gets up, and it gets up, and then eventually we start yelling. I'm going to give you the greatest solution I've ever encountered to this problem, and I promise you, if you are a marriage that yells a lot, it may be something that saves your conversations, and it is the simplest thing in the world. Um, it's simple enough to where I ordered about 200 of these so you could have one tonight. Apparently, Amazon was unequipped. To, uh, to answer my need for 200 sand timers. So like next week, we'll have a bunch of these and you can have them. Here's how this works. Um, it works like you might expect where you're flipping it upside down. Every time you talk, you flip it, and then she talks, you flip it. Here are the rules. Um, one, the person who's talking is the only person who's talking. 
So when it's your partner's turn to talk, they're the only one talking. Next, the person has to keep talking. Okay, so here's what I want to avoid. I want to avoid those moments where you pull this thing out and go, I hate your mom, that's the problem. <laughs> that's really passive aggressive. It's funny, but it's really passive aggressive. It's really passive aggressive, so I want to avoid that. All right, the person listening has to actually listen. Do not stare at that timer like that. <laughs> because I've seen that. I've seen people who are waiting for that timer to go, mm-hmm, yeah, I got it. Yeah, no, I, got, I did all kinds of bad things. We, don't want, we want to avoid that. So the way this little timer works, you start off by having to talk through the entirety of the sand timer, which forces those of you who don't talk as, as freely, it kind of forces you to talk a little bit more. I promise you this. I have used this in the middle of counseling sessions. We agree that we're going to do this ahead of time. This is something we talk about already. When things get heated, I'm going to pull this out, and we all agree that we're going to respect it. I've been working with couples who are yelling and screaming at each other, and when this thing comes out, after about three minutes, everything's calm. Now, they're talking. They may not resolve things immediately, but at least the volume has come down. So keep this thing in mind, and next week I'm going to have a whole bunch of them for you. Uh, the, the, the fight timer can be a really valuable thing. All right, I know the bell just rang, so we're going to wrap this thing up. Um, there are... There are a lot of moments in our marriage that we wish we could take back. There are a lot of moments in our conflict that I know that, that we're not happy about. Uh, but going forward, I want you to commit to changing those things and not finding yourself in these moments. Stay calm. Uh, talking about how you disagree when you're not disagreeing is really important. So tonight, hopefully you're not mad at each other. When you go home tonight, talk about how you fight. What, do you, what are you okay with? What are you not okay with? It, does volume matter to you? And if the answer is no, that's all right. Be willing to say the answer is no. But the reality is having a conversation about fighting when you're not fighting is really important. And then when you get into the moment where things get heated, be willing to stick to that. All right, next week, I mentioned this already. Next week, we are going to talk in great detail about your family of origin. Yes, we're going to talk all about his mom. And we're going to talk all about her parents and her sister. And we're going to, we're going to talk in great detail about that. I'm going to give you a controlled way to have this conversation in a way that benefits your marriage and is not gossipy. I promise you, we are going to be talking about patterns of emotion. That's what we're looking for. All right, we're going to finish out with a word of prayer, and then I will see you next week. Father, I come to you tonight, um, again, grateful for the lives in this room. God, I pray that you will, that you will bless their marriages. Uh, I pray that you'll bless the way they look at each other and that you'll give them the tools that they need to thrive in their marriage. And God, I pray that above all else, you'll give them the kind of marriage that you designed for them. And you'll give them the passion to pursue you and to pursue you together within their marriage. Uh, God, I ask these things through your son. Amen. I apologize for keeping you a little late, but I will see you next week.